I am Uta Orgasa and this is my story Curses of Old. The summer curse had taken hold in the late days of August and it made Heiner shudder to see it move over the Hisland. The sickness, mercilessly cutting down villagers left and right. Heiner watched the unmistakable signs. Glowing faces, based in sweat long after the blazing sun had vanished and clear night skies had brought a welcome breeze. Pustules at the nape of the neck, weakness and slackness of the limbs and dull eyes. The heat wave had been bad enough, but the curse was fast and efficient, taking the most frail and infirm, harvesting the very old and very young. It was maddening, it was unpredictable. Sometimes it took whole families, sometimes it took only one from their midst, sometimes the old and bent survived but the strong men faltered. And the sunburned fields were left without care. Heiner could not have that. He rode his horse into the village in the mornings and made it known that he would raise the levies if the farmers would not come out for work. It was time to bring in his bounty, meager as it was in a year marked by a severe drought. The priest backed a stubborn god for forgiveness each Sunday as the pews showed holes where parishioners should have been. He met them in wooden boxes during the week more often than he could count now. He prayed and blessed while people mourned in quiet desperation. Heiner joined in most of the services. He was not unkind and he felt it was his obligation to the people. He held up his part of the contract they needed to uphold theirs. But the people stared at him with wary eyes and sometimes there flashed glimmers of hatred that, they were n that were never there on second look. He just saw bowed heads of compliance and respect no matter how begrudgingly it was given. They were bound by decorum. Heiner felt unease in his bones rise the longer the skies were cloudless and the curse held. You worry too much, said his father, the old lord, from his bed. Every now and then the curse raises its ugly head. It never stays long, it will be all forgotten by fall. You don't understand, they don't care about the fields anymore. If they don't care about the fields, they should not be surprised if we don't care about their protection, replied his father, sipping cold soup and waving at the girl with the fan to move it faster. Stay away from the village and everything will work itself out for the best, he concluded. Heiner wanted to believe that, but the oppressive heat would not let up and neither would the notices from the priest about yet another villager gone, another future extinguished in the place Heiner was now responsible for. Father, it has never been this dry this long, he said, nor has the curse ever been this persistent. His father grumbled. How would you know? You are not even entirely dry behind your ears. I checked the annals. I read through all of them. From the very first one, I know. Well, keep that to yourself. You can read. They can't. What are we going to do if the rain won't come? We have enough stores to last us, and they will fend for themselves. Meager years come and go. Heiner stopped arguing with his father. The old man was set in his ways and would not listen to reason. Heiner had more funerals to go to. He rode out to the village. The way led along brittle fields and a dried up brook. Everything that should have been green was brown and dead. The sun chased even the slightest shadows. There was nothing there but light. Clara was thirsty. Her tongue stuck to the roof of her mouth. But Mama was sleeping and did not answer to her prodding. And Papa now lived behind the Sunday place. The little girl clambered down from the bed and padded to the larder. She could not find anything to quench her thirst. She put on her bonnet. She would visit Papa. He would help if she could find him. And if not, there were always other uncles and aunties out there somewhere to ask. The front door creaked on its hinges behind the little girl, but there was nobody to pay it any heed. 
Heiner approached the village from the back. The poorest hovels greeted him first, where the outcasts lived. The gong farmers and the sin eaters, the grave diggers and leech collectors. Most of them only coming out at night. He made the sign of the cross as he passed their dwellings, glad for not encountering any of those dark souls. Next he passed the gnarled tree of some elder gods. It had a new wreath around its trunk and melted stumps of candles at its base. Heiner shook his head at those superstitious practices. Further on the road led in a flickering haze. Heiner followed it down to the middle of the village. He stopped in the tavern before making his way to the church. He was parched already, even though it was just mid-morning. The sun had burned relentlessly and his eyes were stinging from the light just as much as from the sweat that he now wiped away while blinking. After the blinding brightness, the tavern felt like a grave. Once Heiner's eyes had adjusted, he noticed the men. There were more than he expected, lined up on stools and benches, watching him in silence. It was a work day, yet none of them were on the fields. They sat in defiance. Several of them wore talismans and charms. None wore crosses. Heiner walked among them to the bar and saw their necks turning like buzzards after him. He had to clear his tight throat before he could speak. An ale, good man! The tavern keeper filled a tankard with a listless liquid halfway full. That is not measured right, said Heiner. Half rations until we can brew again, the keeper replied. Well, slow. A murmur went through the men. Whispered conversation swelled around the room. Heiner looked back at the crowd and was greeted with a wall of silence. He turned towards his drink again. He took a swig. The ale tasted warm and pitiful. It did not quench his thirst. He almost sped it out. A lazy fly killed him itself inside his tankard. Have something stronger? he inquired. The tavern keeper brought out an earthenware bottle, unstoppered it and poured a clear liquid into a pewter cup the size of a man's thumb. That'll give him chest hair, Heiner heard someone whisper behind him. He didn't even bother to turn around this time. Nobody would dare to admit to saying nor hearing such a jest. He swallowed the liquid instead. It went down his throat like fire. He felt the cough coming up, but he, he suppressed it. He wanted, no, he needed to get through to these people. He was their master. He was their rule, their law, their judge and their salvation. He was not his father and every eye in the tavern was watchful and leering. Heiner turned toward them once more. The drought will end. Rain will come. God willing, it will come soon. Only God has not willed it, said a voice in the crowd. Heiner banged the tankard on the counter. Then maybe you should pray harder for him to hear you. He marched with heavy steps out of the tavern. He could feel their eyes heavy on his back. His hands shook and he bought them into fists. His father had done things like this and worse all the time when anyone dared to speak while he was holding the floor. But just like everyone else, Heiner knew he wasn't his father. He took his horse and walked over to the church. The little girl had forgotten why she was walking down the main road, but it did not worry her. The road itself was playing with her, showing her shiny treasures of fantastic dusty rabbits, or waving pathways right in front of her. Clara saw them all and followed the road to touch them, but whenever she reached the spot, they were gone. She only found the everlasting dust covering her bare feet. But look ahead! Another fantastic sight. Clara decided to investigate. Heiner entered the church. Sprinkled through the pews, heads bowed and whispering, women were praying, begging and pleading for life, or at least a better place for their souls. Several of them were veiled in black. One still held a dead baby in her arms. Heiner found it the most peaceful sight in days. She placed it in a tiny coffin with care and tenderly closed the lid. 
the funeral would commence within the hour. He looked for the priest. He found him coming out of the alcove, mopping the sweat off his brow and bringing new candles. The priest's face fell once he recognized who had come into the church. He deposited the candles in the blessings box and motioned Heiner to follow him. Heiner went into the sacristy after the priest. He genuflected as he passed the cross. A meager Jesus looked on as the two men headed towards the priest's place of privacy. The priest closed the door and Heiner sat down in the only chair. What can I do for you? asked the priest. Heiner eyed the bottle of wine and the stoppered carafe of water on the table. He wished to have a sip of either, but he knew they were not his. He exhaled. You parishioners are uncouth and get more disobedient by the minute. Do you not know how to put the fear of God into them anymore? Where is the respect? Where is the devotion? I preach the fiery gospels. I pray with the desolate. I hear their sins and absolve them. What more do you want me to do? Make them listen. I remind them at every opportunity to follow all commandments and to look inward and to clear their souls of any wrongdoing so that their reward will come. What about their punishment? They are living it. Eternity is not easy to convey. Heiner scoffed. What good was being the extension of God if God was not revered as omnipotent and almighty? And how deep was the belief of the people if all it needed to evaporate was a bout of unfavorable weather? The priest was a disappointment in keeping the order of things. Did you bring me more water from your well? The priest had the audacity to ask. If I had thought about bringing any, I would have drunk it by myself now, replied Heiner. What about the funds for the roof and payment for the grave diggers? What about it? It is not my obligation to fund your every desire. The priest opened the door. I shall pray for you. The little girl watched the horse standing in the church's shadow. The horse nosed the ground in search of grass, but it had to face the same disappointment as everyone else. Nothing alive was coming out of that ground. It snorted. It was a pretty horse, chestnut in color, well-fed, tall, muscular, strong. It had a saddle made from supple leather strapped to its back. Its coat was shiny and its eyes vivid. Clara decided that she liked the horse very much. She scratched her neck, her little fingers coming away bloody. She didn't care. Everything was better than its ish, this itch. Her forehead glowed and she swayed in front of that horse, not sure if the ground was moving or she was. The flickering heat had shown her many pretty pictures already that day, but nothing better than that horse. She came closer. The horse nickered. Was it real? How could something this pretty be real? She knew about horses, of course. She had grown up around them. But they usually were sturdy, stout fellows, mostly dappled and calm. And recently, there had been fewer and fewer of them. And they did not look stout anymore. They looked miserable. You could count their ribs and their eyes were dull and their coats even more so. They were wandering listlessly, if at all, behind their farmers. They were a sorry sight. Not this horse. It was massive and lively. It looked like a magical being. She longed to touch it. Heiner blinked once more against the piercing sunlight. The words of the priest still echoed through his head. Fire and brimstone did not face his parishioners any longer, for fire and brimstone were already here. When he could finally focus again on the word outside, he saw a little girl standing right next to Rowan. What was she doing there? Hey, he said, get away from the horse. The little girl didn't hear. She touched Rowan's neck now, her face in utter admiration. Heiner saw the bridle was undone from the post. Had the little girl undone it? Had he been negligent in trying Rowan up? He had no idea. But his horse was not protected by the shade of the church any longer. He stepped cautiously closer. 
What are you doing out here? Where is your mother? She is sleeping, the little girl replied. She swayed from side to side. Her dress was stuck to her with sweat and Heiner could see the telltale blisters on her neck. Heiner felt the sun burn down without mercy. He wanted nothing more than to mount his horse and get out of there. Back home to the cooler stone walls of his keep. Back to where the ale was fresh and quenching and the food was plentiful. Back to where he was safe and sound and not exposed to heat and pain. His father was right. These people did not need him here and nor were they worth his effort. The girl stroked no Rovan's neck. She was not even bothered by the sun and the heat. Of course, she was carrying her own heat within her. Heiner thought she was not going to make it through the night the way she looked. Step away from my horse, Heiner insisted. The girl just smiled. Behind him, Heiner could hear folk pouring out of the tavern. Then three things happened fast as lightning strike and slow as a dream. The church bells boomed for the service. Boom, boom, boom. Rowan reared. The little girl screamed. Rowan's front hooves came down and split her head open, bonnet to neck. Next time I saw, she was on the hard ground, blood pulsing out of the open gash her head used to be. The parched earth leapt up the spilling liquid greedily. Heino saw the panicked look in Rowan's eyes. He moved towards his horse, forcing himself to calm Rowan with steady whoa and slow down boys. He cast one disgusted look to the mangled corpse of the girl. Why had she been there to make his day even worse? The last thing he needed was having to chase his horse in this heat. He wasn't even sure that he would still have it in him to run. The church bells ceased their booming. They still echoed inside Heiner's head. He managed to catch the bridle and keep Rowan from bolting, the two of them doing a little dance to gain control. Rowan was frantic, the whites of his eyes showing. Heiner glanced backwards to see what his horse was so afraid of. There stood the men of the village in a half circle around him. He noticed their sweat-drenched shirts and hard eyes. Your horse killed Clara, one of them said. It was an accident, Heiner replied. He carefully divided his attention between the men and Rowan who was pulling on the bridle. The men's faces were dark, their arms crossed, they came closer. The blacksmith was carrying a hammer. Heiner felt the urge to mount, but Rowan was closer to rearing up once more than holding still. Not only do you do nothing to hell, now you are killing our children outright, said the tavern keeper. Heiner noticed the cudgel in the man's hand. You have abandoned us, and so has your god, said another. The circle of men was tightening. All of them were armed. Poor Klärchen never did harm a soul, said a third. Heiner stepped backwards. The girl was sick, he said. She wasn't supposed to be out here, all feverish by herself. The Rainwright stepped forward, his chisel at the ready. You spilled her innocent blood. And all you cared for was your pretty plump horse, said another man to his right. Heiner could not hold on to Rowan and step back any farther without stepping on the corpse of the girl. Even now his foot had landed on something squishy and he was not going to spend another nauseating thought on what that could have been. He decided to let go of his beloved animal and flee into the church. The church would be his sanctuary. It had to be. The Wainwright snatched the bridle. The chisel came flying, hitting Rowan's flank, and the tavern keeper bludgeoned the horse's head. Rowan's screams were harrowing. It reared, kicked, and jumped, but it was no match for the angry man. They broke its legs, slashed its hide, tore its insides out. The stench of its blood and guts in the heat was sickening. Heiner turned to run. He could not. The circle had closed. He was trapped inside it. Helpless, he was forced to watch them butcher his most prized possession, his pride and joy. Once they were done, their hands bloody, their faces delighted in sneers, they looked at him. Heiner fought nausea and his limbs were shaking.
The church door opened behind him with a groan. The priest stumbled out. He was followed by the women. Sanctuary! Heine cried. You killed my horse, isn't that revenge enough? What happened? yelled the priest. Stay out of it or you'll be sorry, said the rain ride. The women crowded around the men and one of them pointed at what was left of Clara and screamed. Another stepped forward to poke the dead horse. Any hope to plead to the fairer sex vanished from Heine's mind when she said, This will tide us over for a while. The priest composed himself. Good people, show mercy and beg for forgiveness for what you have done. The Lord shall grant your salvation if you repent. Do not act rashly. Thou shalt not kill. Some women crossed themselves, as did two of the men. But the rest of the crowd stood motionless. They all stared at Heiner now. Pointing his bloody smeared cudgel at him, the tavern keeper spoke. The time for your God is up. He did nothing for us. He is not ours. It is time for the old gods again. And they demand your sacrifice.